very warm welcome to the e-lounge. Me, you, us, our lives, our history, our sexualities, our experiences, you and I, us, we are the indomitable. On review this week is the one and only Dr. Taleng Mofokeng's bestseller, A Guide to Sexual Health and Pleasure. Parental guidance is advised for this episode. Tati, as she's fondly known, is a United Nations Special Rapporteur on the rights of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standards of physical and mental health. She's a medical doctor in Johannesburg. She focuses on sexual and reproductive health and rights, and she's also a senior lecturer and a broadcaster. Insights and inspiration stimulate great conversation. The eLounge is one of our knowledge share platforms anchored in our values of learning and leadership. We do hope that you will tune in, engage, take out the way knowledge from this great conversation, and always remember those who desire to lead should read. Thank you. A very warm welcome to the How Training Management Agency's e-lounge. In studio today, we have the indomitable Dr. T. Dr. T, a great pleasure to have you at the studios today. Welcome. Thank you so much, Fiwe. I'm jet so excited. Jet lag ring, you just For landed you, anytime. From <laughs> <laughs> For you, anytime. For you, anytime. Like you say, I have just landed, but I'm so excited um, to spend this time with you. It's been a few weeks, uh, yes. you know, working behind the scenes. And I mean, just to say your work, I really admire as well. Thank you, Dr. T. Thank you very much. Um, you've just landed from Geneva. You are the first, uh, Dr. T, uh, uh, colleagues, welcome those who are joining us on stream, on YouTube, from our MS teams at the office, and all over the world, as we've seen people coming in, you are most welcome to the session. Dr. T is the first woman rapporteur, special rapporteur to the United Nations for Health. Can yep. we take a moment? <laughs> Just thank let you. that sink in. A big congratulations <laughs> thank you, thank as a South you. African woman, as a black child, as an African woman to occupy the seats that have been occupied mostly by male colleagues. We congratulate you, Dr. T. So just tell us a little bit about that. I want to start there before we get on the book on your work that you do at the UN. Uh, what does it entail? And um, what's the mandate really that you, you, you are there? to, to pursue. Yeah, no, you're really speaking the right things, the mandate. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> and it is. I'm a mandate holder um, for yes. the right to health. Okay. In fact, the long term and the long name for that is the right of everyone mm -hmm. to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. Okay. And I think that explains so broadly but so well what the mandate is about. Yes. So my job is to report to the General Assembly and to the Human Rights Council once a year mm -hmm. and also do country visits to any country in the world where there are health-related human rights issues that are emerging past or present and is often um, related to human rights abuses to the right to health. Yes. And I'm also, of course, supposed to be encouraging and supporting and collaborating um, in terms of multi-stakeholders engagements with member states, mm -hmm. with civil society, with businesses, especially now in the time of COVID and vaccines, yes. um, and really encourage human rights um, to be in the forefront mm -hmm. of all the health planning and management and, and policy and all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, being COVID, it's been very difficult to travel. So yes. this has been one of the first few um, flights that I've had to take in this time of COVID, yes. uh, both anxious, uh, but also very grateful mm -hmm. to be able to kind of ease and slowly get back into doing the work of the mandate. And really, you are a human rights defender. Yes. That's the best way to explain it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and mine is a specific one on the right to health. Okay. It, just at the point about mental health, we'll, we'll speak about general health and also sexual health in the times of COVID, which you covered quite well um, in the book. If we zoom in on the issue of mental health, COVID, mm. and um, being at that international stage, what is coming out? You know, what, what, are, what are the issues from the different countries? Are developing countries experiencing more of this? Mm. Are we equipped to deal with the after effects? Mm. I, I, uh, some, someone wrote one day on one of the social media platforms that it is not the COVID pandemic that will actually kill us. 
it's the after effects mm -hmm. which are affecting us emotionally, mentally, and so on. Mm -hmm. So at that global stage, what 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 what's coming out in terms of COVID and the mental health issues? Yeah, and just um, on Tuesday, I was on a panel at the Human Rights Council. Mm -hmm. Now we're speaking about the inequalities that are faced during COVID. Mm. And one of the important things there is that there were a lot of young people from different parts of the world mm. who were talking about the strain that they are experiencing as people who are seeking services. Yes. What's also important that I brought to the table is the strain that health workers are mm. facing at this time. Mm. And I think we take it for granted that nurses and doctors and people in the healthcare sector deal with death every day, yes. but the amount, right, and the ways in people, uh, the, in the ways that people are dying, the isolation from family, the isolation from medical staff itself, because we used to hug our patients, we used to sit and cry with our patients, and now with COVID, all of that suddenly has gone away. Mm -hmm. So even our own mental health as healthcare providers is very, very important at this time. And unfortunately, I'm yet to see um, any, any government around the world that has really been intentional mm -hmm. about ensuring that the mental health and the emotional support for healthcare workers is something that they resource and budget, even at this time. Because remember, for many of us, Viwe, you know this very well. Yeah. Healthcare workers have been the backbone of very fragile healthcare systems before COVID. Yeah. And now we are having to make do with less of us because many of us did die. Yes. And so it's a lot of strain. And I think for us to get quality services, mm. to get accessible services, we have to pay attention to the health care of mental health of healthcare providers mm -hmm. because they take care of us. And if they are unwell, if they are depleted, if they're emotionally spent, mm. they've got nothing else to give us. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And if, let, coming back to the country, um, are we seeing an improvement in terms of those kind of facilities um, where people are able to access um, mental health, especially people who don't have the, the, the fortune of having mm -hmm. um, uh, medical aids and so on, who, who are accessing uh, public mm -hmm. hospitals and public clinics? Um, especially in the rural areas, where are we? We are not in a good space. Um, and we find that more and more people are crying out for help. And I think the worst part is when you know what can be done, but you can't do anything because either physically you are in a different province from the people who are asking for help or there are just no facilities. I mean, we know a lot of people, even when you're phoning around in the uh, public service, you will always be told, ah, we are over capacity, we are full, we are full. And a lot of the issues are urgent. You know, mental health, as much as we think it's just about therapy in the future, many of the issues and what brings the need to the fore are emergency situations, you know, yeah. and we are not doing well. And I can tell you now, even those who have medical aid, even those who have some private funds, it, it's still very inaccessible because it's expensive. Because the stays are lengthy, there's a multidisciplinary team, you know. Um, if I'm your GP viewer and I'm treating you for a chest infection, it's me treating your chest infection and the different medicines you need. But often with mental health, with psychiatric conditions, it's the general practitioner, it's the psychiatric, it's the occupational therapist, it's the counselor, it's the family counselor, it's the psychologist. So there's a lot of people involved um, and it tends to make the service very expensive, even in private, and therefore <clears throat> it remains inaccessible for everyone at the end of the day. And I mean, the issue, of course, in South Africa that we need to talk about, mm -hmm. it's um, our use and um, abuse sometimes yes. of alcohol and drugs. Yes. And you know, I'm a medical doctor, by the way, who believes in, in harm reduction. Um, and that's a very different approach to drug use and alcohol use. Um, that's very different from a, a criminalization of people who use drugs or alcohol, right? Yes. I believe in harm reduction. Um, and that requires us to invest long term into prevention, into information, into community health services and accessible, um, you know, social workers and psychologists in the community. Um, a very different approach, but needs resourcing and money. And unfortunately, Unfortunately, we find that many people in South Africa who, who find themselves, and this is even before COVID regulations, where you could be put into jail for having alcohol on you, mm -hmm. um, were always then put in a criminal justice system as opposed to the health 
system. And I think that's where we keep letting people down, is that we've turned normal medical human experiences into criminal justice issues as a deterrent, but it doesn't work because at the end of the day you are criminalizing people. You are not criminalizing drugs or alcohol because they don't happen on their own. They are happening and being used by people. So we need to have a people-centered approach and harm reduction, I think, is the way we can do that. Yeah, I think, I think we, it, it, this is a topic actually that we can even spend even more time on maybe in another, in another <laughs> session because <laughs> I, I know uh, 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 peeps out there want to know about the book. But one point on, on the mental health issue is we've seen, you know, with the closure of selling of alcohol and when it's opened, the cues and how people long for that mm -hmm. soother. Of, of having access to alcohol to deal with the mental health issues. So I'm also bringing this point up about at this, at this time as there are questions that are coming from younger people who are saying, yes, medical field, but what is it that is needed? Mm -hmm. What is it that the community needs? What is it that is lacking? And for me, the issue of COVID and where we are now in terms of mental health, that's why I, I asked you um, that, mm. that question. But more about you, more about you. Um, you always refer to yourself as Mwanoako Kwakwa. Um, you know, uh, what was quite poignant for me in the book is Aus Engi. Aus Engi. Aus Engi, sorry. Yes. So <laughs> tell us about... <laughs> Little girl called Taling, where did you grow up? What's your mm. journey like? I mean, you know, we follow you on many of the social media platforms, but lots of people want to know, but what has been your journey? You are now special rapporteur to the UN, but where did it all begin? It did begin in the dusty streets of Kragwa. Um, and the memory that I have that I suppose is the most closest to me, um, that is most life-defining for me, mm -hmm. um, I was eight years old, yeah. um, and of course, at the time, it was a Bantustan yes. um, during the apartheid era, and I remember throwing stones at a police in Yala. Mm. And I look back now and I think, <laughs> hey girl, we're only eight, do man like <laughs> oh, How, you know? But the times required Daddy that. Firebrand. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, we were saying you have a you know, it started long ago. Um, and, 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 and I look back now and I think, I wonder how you would have been if you were left alone to be a child, mm. right? Mm. Because it's not normal for eight-year-olds to know how to throw stones at Inyala. Like, yeah. that's not normal, right? But yeah. that's, that's where we grew up. We grew up in that community where mobilization and fighting back literally with our bodies mm. every day was for survival. Mm. And I always say to people that, you know, often, and I think it's because of the liberalized way that we come into many of these issues of human rights and feminism and gender equality, mm. um, that people think we are in this to save other people, to save those women. I'm those women. Mm. I'm doing this work to save myself. Mm. Um, I'm doing this work so that eight-year-olds can play and have their childhood. Yeah. I'm doing this work so that people my age, uh, who are 39, can enjoy time with their families mm -hmm. and not be saying at the UN fighting for human rights. This is why I'm doing this work. Yeah. Um, and, and so my hope is that it finds meaning, it finds um, uh, uh, a home and inspires other people to do what they can, where they can. Mm -hmm. I went to medical school um, and I've always wanted to be a doctor. I've got the most boring story ever. People always say, oh, you know, in, in high school, mm -hmm. the teacher's like, you still want to be a doctor? I'm like, I still want to be a doctor. Yeah. They're like, come on, Kaling, read some more, get exposed. I'm sure there's, I'm like, I still want to be a doctor. Yeah. So I, I've always wanted to be a doctor, okay. but I didn't think I'd be a human rights doctor. But when you look at my life, when you look mm. at all of the issues that have always moved me, um, I mean, in medical school, I had professors who were like, we hear what you're saying, but you need to pass, ne? so mm -hmm. just come down a bit. Uh, 
<laughs> we hear you. Name. Yeah, we hear you, but <laughs> this is for you to pass. Yeah. Then when you've passed, you can, you know, uh, call the fraternity and, and do anything you want to do, which I'm doing. I mean, I speak truth, um, you know, about the medical um, fraternity and mm -hmm. the medical field and the industry as a whole, yeah. about how we could be better as doctors, how we could be better trained mm -hmm. as doctors. Um, and so that's that's why my life is, is here today, um, mm -hmm. fighting for human rights of all people. And um, yeah. I think uh, I look forward to, to the next phase of my life because it's always a surprise. Uh, I never know where I'm going next. Yeah. And, and I don't plan. I think that's why I live in the moment and I, I, and I enjoy where I'm at. Yeah. I, don't, I don't worry too much about the next 10 years. Yeah. You know, if I'm where, I'm, where, I, where it feels good and I want to be there, yeah. I stay. The moment this stops giving me meaning, and it stops giving me joy, then I start thinking about, okay, where to next? And um, that, that's just, yeah, that's who I am. And I have a gorgeous little six-year-old yeah. um, who thinks he's 16, but gay, you know. <laughs> You know, he's like... <laughs> oh, I know where you get that from. Yeah. Exactly, that and from. right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it, it, there's, there's the various lessons from the book, from your mom. And um, there is, I think for most people who've read the book, they, they have an aunt who was like that, or, you know, an older cousin. Um, but for you, it was your mom. Tell us a little bit about your mom and her, I'd say, um, not really following the script or the norm. <laughs> See where I get it from. <laughs> In terms of how parents mm. raise us and educate us about sexuality, educate us about sexual health and conduct and concern. Um, just a, li a little bit about, about your mom because I think she's, she's an important part of the story mm. in the book. I like that you, you picked that up um, and it was intentional mm. that I shared um, those parts in the book. Yeah. And I only wrote the book when I was in a point in my life where I could be vulnerable in that way and be honest in that way. Yes. I could have written it 10 years ago. I didn't. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because I, there's a certain voice um, and an authenticity that needed to come through. Mm -hmm. And, of course, consent, because, she, you know, she needed to know that I'm about to tell people yeah. who she <laughs> is. <laughs> yes. And I, I think it's important because viewer for many of us, um, we, we like that caregiver um, who is honest, mm. who we know will give us unconditional love, mm. um, who has your back always, you know. Yeah. And I thought the relationship I had with my mom, I mean, I would ask her literally, I would ask her and be like, Kijola le mamang, right? And yes. I want to break up with them. Yes. How do I do that? And she'd be like, oh, this and this. is like, but I told you anyway, Hori. You know, it won't work because <laughs> this and this and this. I'm yeah. like, okay, you did, but and 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 I thought there was no more. Yeah. Um. We we you know my mother was was never hiding of her body. Mm -hmm. Um. So I kind of grew up knowing that this is what my body would look like when I'm older. Mm -hmm. Um. I knew about menstruation from her. Yes. Um. Talking about it, and you know, I had my own little pack here before I started, mm -hmm. just in case the day comes because. I think because she was a teacher, she knew, you know, puberty and development would, yeah. would happen soon. So mm. I had my little stack of things that I knew um, I would need when the day comes. Mm. And it's only when I went to boarding school that I really understood how different our relationship was mm. to what my peers were having with their mothers, you know. Yeah. Many of them were very scared of their moms. Mm. Um, you know, they were not able to just communicate and just talk about how their day was, you know. Mm. Um, it, and so... I, I really got to appreciate and, and, and really appreciate her mm. um, when I was older, yeah. uh, mid-teens, and then you know, when I was a, a young woman. And it's those lessons and how she raised me mm. um, that make me, I think, so audacious and so bold. Because I know, no man now when I go home, I'm loved completely mm. and unconditionally. Yeah. There isn't anything I will do in this world Mm -hmm. that will take that love away. And even how she disciplined us, by the way, Viwe. Yeah. Um, a lot of parents threaten kids, you know, if you don't do this, I'll kick you out of the house. Mm -hmm. If you come back here pregnant, you, you, will, you will be the mother in this house and I will leave, right? Mm -hmm. So you are disciplined by constantly being threatened 
with your own livelihood, with your own security, with mm -hmm. your own safety. And as a child, you don't have the cognition to process those threats as threats. We mm -hmm. think legit, this is what's going to happen to me. Mm -hmm. So you are not growing up free. You are scared to talk to your parent about things that happened to you because you've already heard how she blamed you for breaking a glass, right? Or for missing a school shoe or for coming home without your jersey. And you think, oh my gosh, if I tell her this big thing that happened to me, I'm obviously going to be the one at fault again. So we yeah. teach children early in how we discipline them, yeah. what they can tell us, if at all they can trust us, mm -hmm. and if at all we are honest. Mm -hmm. um, and those lessons, of course, many of them came in retrospection, you know. Yes. Um, but I look back and I'm quite thankful. And when I went to boarding school, uh, my friends actually then used to ask me things to ask my mom. And yeah. I, I think I'm the only person who can say, I'm truly asking for my friend. You know that whole yeah. saying, I'm asking for my friend. Like, <laughs> I legit were asking for my friend. I, I, I'm holding a lot of questions here yeah, from you know, a lot of people saying, just asking for a friend, ask to play tea this. I'm like, okay, fine. Asking for a friend, we'll asking leave it there. Asking for a friend, yeah. yeah. I'll leave it there. Um, it, I, I think this is, this is quite important um, in, in that the manner in which we were raised it, it sort of, I always say, monkey see, monkey do, L if I may loosely put it like that. Um, we carry that to our, our children and it's, it's, it's generational. How do we break the generational non-transfer of knowledge and lack of trust and um, um, stable, you know, relationships between mothers and daughters, mothers and sons. Um, I do want to speak about mothers and sons as well, especially mm. with the issue of gender-based violence. But just generally, your view on 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 the issue of um, how can we become better communicators, as you say, and better um, parents, you know, in terms of loving unconditionally when we were not loved mm. unconditionally. I mean, if you leave that tap away at school, you will be punished because mm. it's tap away, you know. Mm. <laughs> and uh, even now, it still happens if you break that China, China cup or whatever. So how do we, uh, how do we break this barrier mm. and, and become better parents in, in our generation and generations to come? And all the young people watching us um, out there in their 20s who are going to become parents one day. Mm. What, I mean, we can't give them advice now in like 10 minutes, but at least what is that takeaway for you that you can mm -hmm. impart to us? So I think you can't give what you don't have, right? Um, and so it's for people who are caregivers. And I say caregivers um, with intention because not every child is being raised by their mother or their father, right? Yeah. My child has been raised by my mom, so she's the primary caregiver. Yes. Um, and so whoever you are as a caregiver, you need to know that information for yourself first. And so that's why I believe that everyone should have comprehensive sexuality education, communications, and some cognitive development support. Mm -hmm. I think we also can't take for granted the history of this country that we come from. Mm -hmm. And that a lot of the scripted learning and the content which we should have received, we didn't receive, right? Because our education was seen as inferior and some of the important knowledge not seen as important. So we have to do the work of giving everyone information where they are. So in school, it's important for us to look at our curriculum and say, is this content serving us? Is it serving young people? And if it's not, we need to mod uh, modify it and, and, and make it strong. Employment, right? You guys are doing it right now. I think as part of induction, when new employees come to work, mm -hmm. they should have some form of ethical personal development and professional development as well. And once you are in the working uh, 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 you know, space, you need to be having continuous professional development that looks at ethics and, 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 and the duty of care you have in the work that you are. And this is now for adults, right? Yes. So that we become adults. Um, who are evolving as well. Because we can't expect people who don't have the same values as the children of today be the ones to impart knowledge on those children. It, we need to accept that what we have been doing isn't working. 
And we don't want to accept that as a country yet. We just want to keep defending it. I mean, there are political parties now who are still saying children must be beaten up and they don't see that as violence. Like, how are we in 2021? And as part of your electioneering, you are saying it's okay for children to be violated. It makes no sense. So we have to accept that what we have done so far isn't working. But on a level, micro level, I think parents should read. There's nothing wrong with saying to your child, I'm not sure, or I don't know. But also share your story. You are also a child. What did you do when you were 12 and you were having all of these questions? And I think that's where the connection and the growth um, and, and the relationship can be built between parents and, and children. You didn't just grow up and be Taleng, who's now a mother to a six-year-old. Sure. I also went through things in life. Mm -hmm. But we also have to make sure that mental health and, and, and psychological support is important. Many of us are closed down. Many of us, it's not that we are not talking to our children because we don't want to. It's because we don't want to open up the wounds within ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about how do we not pass on trauma, Sometimes silence and doing nothing in the head of someone who knows what they have gone through and they don't want to pass that to their children, they think silence is a better option. And so unless parents, anyone who requires emotional, psychological support to process traumas that have happened to them has access to them, we also can then just demand that they miraculously find it comfortable to talk about sex and sexuality with their children. A lot of us are survivors of violence, whether in the home or interpersonal violence or violence from the community in the streets. Mm -hmm. And we are yet to process that. And so when the mother says, no, 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 don't go out uh, after six o'clock, mm -hmm. right? And they start threatening you with all sorts of things because they're trying to say to you, it's not safe out there. Mm -hmm. But they can't articulate, right? Because she's not ready to tell you that she was raped mm -hmm. at a party, right? So she starts blaming herself because the rest of the society blames people, right? Um, especially victims of sexual violence, especially women and girls. Mm -hmm. So we start to internalize that and make it part of our story. So you start looking at yourself as if indeed that was my fault and if I modify my behavior, uh, maybe I can prevent it in my child. And so we start sort of disciplining children and raising children from a fear-based point, yeah. you see, where we are fearful of what could happen to them. So we are raising them to try and avoid that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the, it, there's a huge, um, uh, I mean, if we haven't done it already, uh, a, a clear need for mental health support. Mm -hmm. And it benefits everyone. It, it benefits the individuals. And it benefits the society, it benefits the children and the generations we are trying to raise. And this should be available everywhere, right? I don't know if you know about this, but um, I did the UJ Helen Joseph lecture, memorial lecture this year. And in that preparation, I also found out some interesting things about her, mm -hmm. um, that she was involved in, in unionizing and um, forming unions for black women who were working in the textile um, and clothing um, industry. Mm -hmm. And she actually fought for uh, employers to actually pay for medical, uh, um, not medical aid at the time, but for medical services yes. for employees, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And I thought that was groundbreaking. So we need to build on that work that have been done by women before us because we know what it takes to raise children. Yeah. Now we are working from home. Now we are also teachers because we are doing schooling from home. But you are also a partner. Mm -hmm. You are also a friend. You're also an auntie to somebody. So how do we navigate all of that without losing who we are, who Viwa is, who Taleng is, right? Because for as long as I, my cup is not filled, I can't fill yours. So there are ways in which we even talk about ourselves um, that concentrating on Viwa and making sure Viwa is okay is not selfish. Mm. It's necessary. And I've had to learn that in this work, right, of feminism and gender equality and human rights, where there's constant backlash and constant pushback in terms of the work we're doing. Mm. I can't do this work if I don't take care of myself. And so taking care of myself cannot be selfish. It's needed for the longevity of the work um, that, that's out there. So I think also for mothers, especially for aunts, for, for people who, who are generally feeling that they have to be everything to everybody, it's just don't feel bad or selfish for taking that time um, to yourself, to connect with yourself, mm. um, because that's the best you we need in this world. Yeah. 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 Gender-based violence, it, it, it's, 
is my next point on, on this one. Um, the conversations that have been going on, um, we've seen in the country, there's lots of women. It, it, the scourge is just growing. It's growing and growing. And there seems to be no end in sight. Um, so there's a conversation we're having with, with friends, and I was saying to them, but the person who's a perpetrator most of the time, or all the time, has family, has a mother, has a sister, has a brother, cousins, they know who, who the person, they know the behavior. Whether it's a woman or a man, by the way, it, it's not to say that it's only men who are abusers. Why do you think as a society, we haven't got into that, that point where we can be able to call into order our own family members in their behaviors, which are also emanating from hurt that perhaps they might have experienced, which now they are you know, exposing by hurting other people or dealing with it by hurting other people. What can be done in the country in terms of that? What's your view, in fact, in terms of that? Yeah, look, violence is about power. It's about taking power from someone who is seen to be powerless or having less power. Mm -hmm. And this can be literal physical power, but it's also social capital. Mm -hmm. It's also um, political capital and power. Mm -hmm. And so when you say, you know, we all have family and sometimes people know, mm -hmm. if you interrogate the relationships there and the dependency and the economical situation, you'll find that people who are abusers usually tend to occupy some social standing or have social capital. So that when, they, when someone then says, so-and-so did this to me, mm. there's a roaring chorus that says, oh, no, they would never because they pay my rent. Oh, no, but he, they are the most loving relative ever because they bought me this and this and this, right? Mm. So we need to start thinking and understanding violence through the power lens, right? That people who perpetrate violence understand and know how to maneuver around. We often think about gender-based violence, about the bruises and the injuries, right? Mm. But often before there's the physical assault, there's already been a mental assault. Mm. They've already primed you. They've already alienated you from your family or your friends. Mm. They've already started to make you question your own self-esteem and your self-worth, right? Mm. And your own judgment. So that when they do something, you sit and think, oh no, but maybe, maybe I contributed somehow in this, right? Mm. So we need to understand violence in, in its entirety. So, funny enough, um, on the way back to the airport, we see a helicopter mm. and one of the persons who was driving me, and we say this at the same time, oh, it must be a stolen car, at the same time. Mm. And I was like, why do you say that? He's like, no, because we know whenever there's a chopper that's l flying low, yeah. they are looking for a tracking device yeah. on a car. Yeah. And I say to them, do you see what the problem is? We value property more than we value human life. I said with all of the women and children, let's talk about the children in this country who go missing every day, every week, every month. Mm. Have you ever seen a low flying chopper looking for missing children? No. Right? And so even the idea of policing in this country needs to be interrogated. Mm. Who is the police for? The police is mainly here to protect property. Mm. Whose property? It wasn't mine and yours property. I was in a Bantustan, yeah. right? Yeah. We're made to crop in snow in the, in the hills of the Maluti. Mm -hmm. There was no property to protect there. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's an export from the American-based type of policing in the slavery period, mm -hmm. where the slave masters were protecting their property, which included black people. Yeah. And people around the world just lapped that up and outsourced that type of policing. And that's why it's not working here. Mm -hmm. That's why our relationship with the police is very different. Mm -hmm. And then bringing the, our own history of colonialism and apartheid and how the police itself were used and were a tool, right, of perpetrating that racial violence. Yeah. So our idea 
of police and why we go to the police is very different. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I'll show you some other thing that I think is also a form of violence, which you don't talk about often. Mm -hmm. If mine and your car get stolen, we go to the police, we open a case. Mm -hmm. Have the police ever asked you, well, why were you driving a Merc at night? Do you not know that in South Africa, hijacking is a high crime? They don't ask you that. They don't ask you and say, but why did you buy a BM anyway? Because uh, it's most expensive. Why don't you just drive a little skodonk and avoid being hijacked? They don't ask you that. Why? Because they understand how to protect property. Mm -hmm. But what do we want from rape victims? We want them to shout it out. We want them to tell everybody. Mm -hmm. We want to ask them, what were you wearing? Mm -hmm. We want to ask them, why were you there? Mm -hmm. And so it tells you that our priorities are completely messed up. If I come and say my phone was stolen, the police don't even ask me 20,000 things. They give me the form, you sign, on that case number, you go and claim it from your insurance. Done. No one says, oh, but all the victims of stolen phones, they must tell us so we can believe them first. But we demand that of people who are victims of gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. And that is the hypocrisy in which we find ourselves in. But it's really all about power at the end of the day. Yeah. Where power lies, mm. and we know even in the criminal justice system, um, how does it help you reporting a rape? Because we read every day again what happens to rape, uh, rape victims in courts. We, do. we read about what happens to people who are perpetrators. In fact, when we look at um, the, the statistics, um, it clearly shows that uh, what is reported is actually way less than what is actually, you know, happening on the ground. Absolutely, absolutely. Much, 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 much less. Um, so we, we, we're going to get back to, 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 to that a little bit. Um, but I wanted us to just zoom in on your work, you, you know, your advocacy work, um, sexual health work, and the the love the people have for your work. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I follow many doctors, but there's very few that have got so many nicknames as you do. <laughs> you know, Dr. T, Dr. Tlof, Dr. But, you know, um, it's, I think for me, it is just an indication of the work you do, how it impacts uh, people's lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, my question to you is, where is the source, the drive, um, the well, the energy to mm -hmm. do all of that work? Because I've never seen you saying, no, I'm not going to answer this question. I <laughs> be easy. It's always, 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 I'll refer to this or let me answer the question or please check this. I've dealt with this before. Where is that well coming from? That I drive for, I'm going to be a, a health activist mm. and sexual health activist, human rights, because it is human mm. rights overall. Yeah. Mm. I had very good teachers growing up. Mm -hmm. I had very amazing lecturers in medical school. And one thing about all of them is that they saw that fire and they didn't dim it. Mm -hmm. Instead, they said, oh, tell us more. So how do you see the world, right? So I would talk and talk and be like, this is what I want to do and this is, what I, this is what I think. And, and they wouldn't say, oh, I know what tell. Mm. They'd be like, oh, that's interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Or offer me advice or offer me solutions or give me this other book to read. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that's what also people out there need. I have information that people need. Yes. And so if I can give it to you myself, like literally myself, I will always tell you where to get it. I will share with you a resource that has worked for me or another colleague, right? Yeah. And it was in medical school when we did the principles of family medicine. And one of the principles of medicine is that as a doctor, you are supposed to understand the context of illness of your patient mm -hmm. and you are supposed to advocate for your patient. And those two has never left me. And that is, this is how I practice medicine. Yeah. When you come to me and say, I have a headache, 
or ah, sex is boring now, I don't want to have sex anymore. Mm -hmm. I think about the context of your life. So when I ask you questions, it's for me to get to understand the context mm -hmm. of your illness. Because my headache and your headache may be very two different headaches. Mm -hmm. And unless the doctor is invested in understanding who you are yeah. and who I am, they may just be thinking, ah, people who come here only have headaches. Mm. But I may be coming here, which has happened to me, you know, community health clinic, where people were just, you know, lambasting the fact that this particular woman keeps coming here every other week or maybe even twice a week sometimes. Mm. And I said, there's a pattern. There's a context in which her headache is happening. Mm. We need to find that out. And she just couldn't say it out loud that I'm being abused and my children are also at risk. But she used to come to the clinic repeatedly hoping that someone will notice this. So that's why I think for me, um, uh, I love the work that I do because it gets me to understand people intimately. Mm -hmm. the, being an advocate for your patient is also important because this is where the, the drive comes from. This is where the activism comes from. I used to think, um, and I think like many people, that as a doctor, you just put on your white lab coat and you do the doctor thing. But even my doctor thing is happening within an economic, social, political context. Mm -hmm. And I started looking back at the content of what we were being taught at medical school and realized there was very little on human rights. Mm -hmm. And that's why doctors often miss the power dynamic in the consultation room, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes you leave home saying, okay, I'm going to tell the doctor this and this and this. And you get there and you are so scared to even say a word yeah. to the doctor. Yeah. Because the doctor, you know, you see? Yeah. So even those things are important. And, and I don't forget those things. Mm. Um, and, and for me, it was intentional. Because when I did community service, it was the 2010 World Cup. There was World Cup fever everywhere in the air. But I was a young person myself, right? Who needed services around my own sexual and reproductive health. And I needed a particular doctor who understood me and my needs as a young person. Mm. And I found that actually, I'm gonna to have to be my own doctor here because there isn't someone I can just talk about the fact that, I'm not even sure if I'm having orgasms and um, I wanna postpone my period because I'm going on a weekend away yeah. and I don't want them to judge me. Yeah. You see, yeah. I'm like, there's more of us who need this kind of thing. Yeah. So what's happening here? So that's why I, started to actually spend more time with young people, youth, mm -hmm. in the clinics where I worked. Yeah. Because then I realized that if Nna as the doctor who's young is having difficulty having these conversations with my own doctor, mm. imagine how they must feel. Imagine how they must feel. And so that's why then my focus started being more on, on sexual health, um, particularly looking at the needs of women, because I found that even when I then started asking women in the consultation room, how are you? And they tell me how they are and their cough or whatever they came for, hypertension. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, so how's sex? Are you enjoying sex? Oh. Shocking. <laughs> and then someone was like, oh my God, thank God you asked. Because <laughs> I was never going to ask. But actually, now that you asked, and then they would come out with the things, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's how, that's how I knew that this is something that's needed. Um, it was from my own experience as, as being a doctor and seeing how far removed we are from our patients' realities, mm -hmm. but also uh, being that young person who needed um, those services and those consultations with my own doctor. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, remember in the years of um, the HIV um, disaster that we did as a country and how we managed it then. Yeah. Um, during all of that, I was also in medical school, right? Mm -hmm. So I have a historical memory also mm -hmm. of how patients who are seen to be sexual, sexually active, how sexuality, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and those that are even imposed on us. I guess as a young girl, if you ask for contraceptions, automatically they call you names, you see? So there's a certain promiscuity mm. that is assumed on us when we ask for information. And that's why women just keep quiet about their sexual lives because you don't want to give the idea that you know too much or you are too eager to know about sex. And so I, I, I could see how even in the way we ask a sexual history was problematic. So I started asking that history very differently with my patients and getting different results. And I was like, okay, this is working. Um, and, and what was really amazing is that when, when the book first came out, mm -hmm. I had an obstetrician mm -hmm. who sent me a message 
to say thank you very much. There are now things in there that I know to ask my patients about their own sexual pleasure that I was not before, mm -hmm. right? And I said, well, that's amazing, and that's the point. That's the point, is that anyone can be a recipient of this information and find it useful depending on where they are in their life. Mm -hmm. It's about health, it's about understanding your own sexual rights, but also respecting other people's rights. Yeah. Um, and it's about ultimately defining for yourself what is the best sexual experiences are and then getting assistance with the medical health needs or safer sex needs to be able to make that come alive. Yeah. So the, 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 the issue of um, young people in accessing um, support in, for their sexuality, whether it's contraceptives or um, treatment for, for, for diseases that they might have contracted, and the treatment that they get from the healthcare facilities, that's still, that's still continuing, right? It, we're not getting mm. improvement um, in that. And through your advocacy work, I think at least that begins because with, with in, the, in the age of social media, people have now better access to, to such information. But someone also um, in all the villages doesn't have access um, to that. Um, is the opportunity in the country to kind of change the way our healthcare facilities deal with the issue of sexuality and supporting sexual health for young people mm. in terms of providing contraceptives and the right advice before we even get there because young people are curious, they do want to get information, they want to be informed and they want to know what their options are. But our healthcare facilities, are they geared to do that? The answer is no, they are not geared to do that, um, but they must be geared to do that. And okay. The opportunities are there, there are many. Mm -hmm. And many of us have tried at very different levels to, to, to do something, okay. but it's incredibly difficult. And remember the issues of sex and sexuality are very political, right? Mm -hmm. The control mm -hmm. of women's bodies um, is not just something that we are now just experiencing in GA because of you know, out of the blue. It's, mm. there's, a, there's a whole system, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so the control of women's bodies, reproduction, fertility, right? Mm -hmm. In South Africa particularly, was also part of the apartheid regime's violence. Mm -hmm. And so we need to, that's why I keep saying that the content of medical and nursing training is very important. We need to train doctors and nurses who understand their role as human rights defenders okay. in the practice of mm. their profession. Mm. Because many, unfortunately, when even you can go now to the clinic, they will still tell you about the Bible. Oh, no, you must read this first. Are you sure this is what you want? Mm. And you are just like, you know what? I don't want to be pregnant anymore. Mm. Right? There's a whole act that supports you saying, I don't want to be pregnant anymore. Mm. But instead of people helping you, the very doctors and nurses are the ones who are going to be opening a Bible for you. But viewer, you know where the pastor is if you need the pastor. If you are at the clinic, you need, you need health medical. services. And so it's very important, I think, for us to realize um, and, and, and respect our roles as healthcare providers. We are not anyone's parent or nannies or... Mm. You know, we are there to fulfill a particular health need. Mm. And, and those are some of the things that young people will tell you about. You know, they are scared to go to the clinic because if they go to the clinic, Umama Mosondo will now know all of their things because it's in that community. Yeah. Yeah. And in that community, we perhaps all go to the same church. Yeah. And, and how do we deal with that? And the only way to deal with that is to remind nurses and doctors about confidentiality, privacy, right? Mm. Um, integrity, autonomy, which are all human rights principles, by the way. But unless you you judge us as healthcare workers on those things, we are not going to reflect because we are not going to actually account for when we don't implement them properly. We'll just say, ah, we are so happy that the 16-year-olds don't come anymore. But they don't come anymore because you are abusing their rights. 
to information and to services. And so the other element, of course, which is something that I've, I, I chose to do after ComServe was to do radio and TV and write yes. about sex yeah. and about sexual pleasure yeah. because I wanted to demystify it, mm -hmm. right? A lot of how we talk about sex and pleasure is about fear and avoidance, mm -hmm. right? Avoid it for spiritual reasons, avoid it because you want purity of some sorts, mm -hmm. and fear of disease. If you do this, you will get an STI yeah. and not much else. And that's why consent is so important because if you are just saying to people, fear, avoid, it's not going to help mm -hmm. because when the decision is then made to actually have sex, they still won't know what consent should look like. They won't know how to seek consent. They won't know how to give consent. They actually won't know how to use the safer sex tools properly. Because all you did was abstain from this and, and get away from it because it's, it's bad for you. Mm -hmm. But sexual health is a life skill. Like we all learn how to drive a car. Yeah. And there's a book and a manual of all of the road signs. Yeah. The same with relationships with humans. The same with sexual interaction with humans. We need to know how to seek and get consent and give consent. Mm -hmm. We need to know that, by the way, if I say I don't feel like having sex right now, even in married relationships, it's not a catastrophe. It doesn't mean something bad has happened. We need to stop catastrophizing our experiences and honoring what it is that we are saying we want. If I say, you know what, not today, maybe kissing only today, can we honor that? It doesn't mean there's a catastrophe. And we need to have our identities, our womanhoods, our manhoods identified outside of what my genitals can do to you. Because the problem now mm -hmm. is that many people are defining who they are, their power, their strength, everything about themselves, about what their genitals can do to somebody else. Yeah. Right? That's why about to umfazaga shower, ushawa gupi, and bedding. And that perpetuates violence. violence yes. That says, if you are my wife or you are my girlfriend and we are in bed, I can do whatever I want because this defines who I am. In fact, you must be lucky that I'm only doing this here. Yeah. And that is rape culture. Yeah. So, and often we say these things like, ah, ha, 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 but if you think about what it, what it does, it takes away your agency before we even start. Mm -hmm. It already says to the person you are in that relationship with, I have more power than you. And that's why violence, like I said in the beginning, is about power. Mm. So every time the interactions are about, I'll cut you down to science. He will not hurt them. Who do you think you are? You are the CEO at work, not here. Why? Oh, you are just there. It's power. Yeah. It's power. Yeah. And, and that's the problem. Um, There's a very, um, right at the beginning of the book, you, you really delve into the anatomy of, of women and also men. Um, but what, what came out and is also gonna come out in the questions here is how you reinforce body positivity. Mm. And um, women being comfortable, because I think to a large extent, men are comfortable with their womanhood. They, it's, it's weaponry, it's power, uh, it's ego, it's everything. But when it comes to women, um, it, it, it's not the same. Women are not comfortable with their bodies. They're always dissatisfied with their bodies. Um, they are scared to look at how big their boobs are, much worse, you know, to look at um, their own vaginas or what is happening there. So in terms of, of, of body positivity, how can this message be transferred even further that it is your body, you own it. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and it, also, it also manifests itself now in other areas of your life, right? Mm -hmm. If you cannot stand in front of your mirror and say, I love these hips, let's do this, yeah. right? So, advice there. Yeah, so it's a whole spectrum um, mm -hmm. with sex positivity. And like you say, there is so much already out there that tells women that you are not good enough, you are not pretty enough, you are not thin enough. 
even our hair, you know, even the hair product, people tell us that our hair is frizz and dull and whatever. So there's a lot. <laughs> then there's also the pharmaceutical industry, right? If you think about the information you know about women's health and the vagina and how clean a vagina should be, it's from an advert, an advert that's designed to sell product. Yes. So already it tells you that the people whose messaging is this is coming from don't have your best interest at heart. Their messaging is about selling products, telling you what's wrong with you so you can be perpetually seeking to make yourself better. Mm -hmm. As if who you are by default mm -hmm. is problematic or naturally um, unwell or not good enough. So you must constantly be seeking validation and be seeking these products to make yourself yeah. more normal. Yeah. And someone also asked me, you know, what's normal? I said, what's normal is what's on you. That's what's normal. Mm. That's it. Mm. And, and it's important when we talk about body positivity to, to remember how much we have to unlearn. And there's a big joke I always tell my mother. I'm like, do you remember when I was little, you guys used to say, you're too skinny. Eat, eat, eat. Yeah. And then I started to eat. <laughs> and you all came back and were like, hey, and I, and I stopped them. There were, <laughs> there were three. <laughs> it was my mom and two other friends. I said, uh-uh, uh-uh, don't you dare. I can't have been hearing this chorus, it can't be this way. And I was just defending my own autonomy, right? Of course, you grow up, things happen, there's hormonal issues, and I speak about my own fertility issues in the book, yes. and we can talk about all of that, but just as a principle, mm. there is so much about our bodies and, and how we are that, honestly, unless you stop and just take a moment, you will be in that spiral. It's like it's almost like a, a, a rabbit hole. It just sucks you in. And you are constantly seeking to make my vagina tight, make it loose, make it wet, make it dry. Make it, it's a lot. And remember, I hear a lot of these in a day. And I'm like, guys. I'm so glad you got that. Sorry to cut you. I'm so yeah. glad you, 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 you mentioned that because one of the questions that came through was um, the, the, the surgeries to make the vaginas tighter and also the steaming and the products that are they're becoming more and more now in, in terms of washes, wipes, and, and, and to clean the vagina. Um, from yourself and may her soul rest in peace, Dr. Cindy Fancey, she always was saying, guys, the body is very clever it can clean itself. Mm -hmm. Can you dis demystify this for us? Is there a need for somebody to buy a vaginal wash? Is there a need for somebody to go and do other instances where one would need to modify their vagina, make it tighter or wetter or what are all these things? And the steaming, please, please, please. Because so the steaming is a big no. No, no steaming. Um, <laughs> no. And remember, there's a different practice of medicine, right? So there's yeah. us, the medical doctors, and um, homeopathic people who practice, those practitioners. And we are very different. We are judged by very different standards. Yeah. If I'm going to recommend something to you, it needs to be scientific. It needs to be research-based. I need to know all of the indications. I need to know the contraindications. I need to know how to manage when something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. I can't say that for steaming. I can't say that for eggs that people put in their vaginas. Mm -hmm. I can't say that for any of these tinctures and concoctions. Mm -hmm. So as a doctor, there's no way I would advise anyone does that. And medically speaking, the genital area has the groin, right? Yes. And you've got the pubic hair. That needs washing. You sweat, you are running, you are stressed. Just everyday life going about it, just like you wash your umpers, you'll wash that area. But there is no need to then go into the vagina itself and start fiddling with the vagina to an extent where people have put in snuff, they've put in garlic. I've had to remove a garlic from a, 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 a vaginal canal before, right? There's no need to be inserting stones or eggs or anything like that in that area. 
the vulva area would look different because remember the vulva has the big lips, the small lips and all of the different openings mm -hmm. and the pubic hair. My normal is my normal. Your normal is normal. So if you have surgery to modify it, you are modifying it to what? To, to what are you modifying it to? And these things are happening, by the way, mm. at the back, and they are now they're getting sophisticated. Mm. But at the back of it all, at the root of it all, we have to talk about patriarchal power and how that manifests. And back in the days, which is something that's still happening now, mm. there's something that is called the husband stitch. When women used to give vaginal birth, there was this idea that the vagina remains loose and all of those things. Mm -hmm. And husbands were demanding tight vaginas from the doctors, mm -hmm. who were mostly men, as they are still today. Mm -hmm. And they would do an extra stitch on women's vulvas mm -hmm. to make it tighter. Mm -hmm. For when men want to start having sex with women, mm -hmm. that they have this imaginary tightness. Mm -hmm. My vaginal opening may be tighter, but my vaginal canal remains the same, right? Okay. And so... They were damaging women mm. and doing this without their consent. And so I see these steamings, vaginal rejuvenations, surgery, all of these, I see them in that same spectrum. There is no difference. Mm. Is that now what they've done well is to say to women, you are the problem. So women are now the messenger. Mm. So instead of people doing things behind your back, they've ingrained it in us that there's something abnormal. So we start to seek it. And then they say, but women want it. But have women got actually accurate, proper information about their vulvas and how their vaginas work? No. Mm. So all of the messaging has been left in the hands of people who want to make you to want these products. So can we truly say that women want these? Mm. Because what's the alternative? And if you ask women, what's the alternative? They don't know what the alternative is mm. because they don't even know their own bodies and how they're supposed to be working. And that's why life orientation is important. And life orientation is important for both girls and boys and other children who are, by the way, um, um, uh, gender non-binary, yes. right? There are lots of children who are growing up like, I'm not a boy, I'm not a girl, I'm who I am. Yeah. And as a society, we need to also make sure that even in how we speak to children about children, we make sure that we are inclusive because they grow up knowing that in this society, they don't recognize me and who I am because I, I, I'm not a boy, I'm not a girl, I'm just who I am. Yeah. So there's a lot of we can talk about, but uh, it's important to understand where these things come from. Mm -hmm. It's about controlling women's bodies, controlling your pleasure, and they will use religion, they will use culture. The economy mm -hmm. of the vagina is huge. That's why there are so many products <laughs> out there. But there isn't information that is just truly just scientific and research-based that just says to you, this is what normalcy looks like. And if people want vaginas that smell like mangoes, they must go buy mangoes because they, there is no way a vagina can smell like a mango, you know. And it was in 2015, by the way, um, all roses. I mean, um, <laughs> when, when we're having this conversation, you know, and I, and I say to people, the vagina is a self-cleansing machine, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Just like your inner mouth. You see how sensitive your inner cheek is? Yes. That's how sensitive the walls are in your vaginal canal. You wouldn't go and take a skirpot and start rubbing in your, in your cheek no. because oh, your cheek is dirty. Mm. No, you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't take snuff and just put garlic and just sit there with it and steam your mouth. You wouldn't because you understand that this, this, this doesn't make sense. But with the vagina and vagina's health, unfortunately, a lot of marketing, a lot of information, um, it's, it's been left in the hands of people who are only interested in profiting from telling you, what's abnormal about actually a very normal um, process. And you can think about even, you know, uh, giving birth. So many different things and so many different... It's like, let's get back to basics, <laughs> you know? And about giving birth, one of the things that um, is prevailing now, or debate rather, is the C-section vis-a-vis natural birth. So what is your view there? There's a lot of young women who've actually sent me this question to say, um, if I go for a six section when I'm having a baby, it's easier, it's quicker, it's, you know, um, but this um, natural birth, I'm not so sure about. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm, I'm gonna refer you to the doctor. I know what the answer is, but I'll <laughs> 
I will refer you to the doctor. <laughs> and I actually speak a little bit about it in the book, yeah. especially because of that, right? Um, and there's a lot of judgment of women who have had a C-section. Yes. And that's how I started actually interacting with that issue, C-section versus vaginal, is because of the shame that was being put on women who had a C-section. And often by extended family, um, you know, in that, in that first month or so when people, you know, uh, if you still practice a tradition, we are still it's somewhere else, right? Yes. And the big people want to know, oh, how did you have a child? And then you're in C-section and then suddenly they look at you like, ah, are you even woman enough? So even the definitions of what makes a woman, you know, all of them still very flawed. Mm -hmm. But what's important, and I call them both natural birth, by the way, and there's a reason why I do that, is that if you are pregnant, that fetus must come out yeah. one way or the other. Uh -huh. And if there's a medical indication for why you need a, a caesarean uh, section, which is a surgical intervention, yeah. or things were going well, the fetus is healthy, you are yourself healthy and in a physical condition to do vaginal delivery, you do it. Mm -hmm. So this fetus will come on this planet, however way it needs to come, and safely for both of you. That's what we need to decide. Yeah. And sometimes people have a, a cesarean section, even though they physically are well and healthy and ready to have a vaginal delivery, mm -hmm. but the, the, the position of the fetus may be such that actually, even if you wanted to, to do vaginal delivery or birthing, mm -hmm. you actually can't. So we have to do a cesarean section. Mm -hmm. And it's a misconception that C-sections are easy, and that you heal faster. Both have complications that can happen, a vaginal delivery and a cesarean delivery. And when you opt for, for, for example, and, 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 and um, so back in the days, the rules were much stricter in terms of when a person can have a C-section. Yeah. But now doctors and their patients talk mm -hmm. and they say, I prefer to have a cesarean and people tell their doctors why, mm -hmm. right? And it's up to you and the doctor to make sure that ethically you are meeting the standards for good care. Yeah. You need to know the complications. Mm. You need to know what can happen. And depending on, on where you are also, some of these choices are not there for every woman. We need to realize there's a certain class privilege mm. that some of us have that allows us to have these conversations mm. when in fact the process of birthing is a very delicate and very important process. Mm -hmm. And it has to be done in the skilled hands, not always in the skilled hands of a doctor. Midwives are very important. Mm -hmm. And more children are birthed by midwives, by the way, yeah. than by doctors. Yeah. So we need to remember um, that many people in those villages you named, Havana yeah. Nago, to be like, oh, Caesar, vaginal. Yeah. Honestly, if we are practicing good ethical medicine, we should be going about what's indicated and what isn't indicated. And both of them require informed consent. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's very important. And it, it, it's, it's, of course, <laughs> it may seem easy because people say their vaginas remain intact and nothing happens there. <sighs> Again, we are playing into that <laughs> same narrative, right? Yeah, yeah. That there is something intrinsically wrong about a vaginal birth yeah. that leaves you so disconfigured mm -hmm. that a caesarean will save you from all of this. It's wrong. There are many complications to a caesarean. Um, and it's not just an easy peasy procedure as, as people would like to think. In the skilled hands, whether you're having a vaginal or a caesarean section, ultimately we want a healthy mother mm -hmm. and we want a healthy baby. Mm -hmm. And we will choose the root that is possible, that is feasible for both of those to happen. Thanks, Dr. Uh, I see the questions coming thick and fast. Uh, uh, yeah, it is 20 past uh, uh, four, so I will get to the questions now, colleagues. Um, you mentioned something earlier about, about oh, you actually didn't, I was reading one of the final chapters, uh, Sexual Pleasure in the Times of, of COVID. Now, you may or not may not answer this, but this has now been a question that's been coming all the time, that with these vaccinations, 
COVID-19 vaccinations? Do they cause erectile dysfunction? Do they cause lack of uh, sexual desire in women? What What is the, the, the impact thereof? Because there are a number of people um, that are not going to vaccinate mm -hmm. because they are saying, uh -uh, this, this vaccine is going to alter my sexual health or pleasure, so I'm just going to sit this one out. So the simple answer is no. Um, the vaccine will not alter your desire or the ability for you to have erectile dysfunction. Mm -hmm. The method and, and how the vaccine works and, and how you get to build that immunity does not interfere at all. To get an erection, you need to be sexually aroused. You need your penis, which is a muscle, mm -hmm. to have enough blood supply. Mm -hmm. And that's how you get an erection. That's all you need. Yeah. And there are other medical reasons why people may have difficulty or a change in their erection. Mm -hmm. Cardiovascular disease like hypertension, diabetes, right? Yeah. Um, that people may not have been diagnosed with, that they don't know is there. And if you're already inclined to say, I don't want a vaccine, it's very easy to just come up with any excuse. And I say to people, and I've had this conversation with a few of my patients, the concern they have for the vaccine, is it that important that they would risk dying for? That's the question we need to be asking when you're talking about the vaccine. Whatever concern you have, is it worth you getting COVID and dying for it. That's what you need to answer because the vaccine gives you a chance, yeah. a fighting chance to say, even if I get this infection, mm -hmm. because I have the vaccine, my body will be able to respond better. I will have milder disease. Even if I get hospitalized, I won't end up in ICU, intubated on the machine. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's life saving. And that's what we are talking about. Yeah. There are definitely valid concerns about it, mm -hmm. right? Does it work? the safety, of course, some side effects. And a lot of women have also been talking about changes to a menstrual cycle, by the way, mm. right? Mm. But how women have talked about the changes to their menstrual cycle is us sharing so we know and check in with each other, but we are still getting vaccinated. Yes. Men, on the other hand, are using a hypothetical scenario of an erectile dysfunction to convince each other not to go for vaccines. Mm -hmm. And those are the two difference, um, differences in conversations that people are having. There are legit and legitimate concerns that people have, and you must have those conversations with your doctor. Yes. You know, if you have underlying medical illnesses that you are not sure about and your safety. Mm. You know, I deal a lot with people who want to get pregnant, who, who are now pregnant, and we've also had the discussion about the safety of vaccine in pregnancy, for example, right? And we had those discussions, and patients understand, and we have the data um, and the science to prove that, in fact, they work um, in pregnant women quite safely, and many of them have had the vaccine. So what we mustn't do, Viwe, is get stuck in hypothetical scenarios mm -hmm. that are not based on actual, real-life evidence, yeah. you know? Yeah. Okay, that was a question that actually came through just now. So I hope that that, that answers the question. Get um, your vaccine. Get the vaccine. Please. But Dr. T is very clear. If you have concerns, please have a discussion with your medical practitioner. Um, on sexual rights, there were some questions about termination of pregnancies. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to say that um, pages, I think it's from page 27, if I'm not mistaken, but right at the beginning of, in fact, um, yes, page 51, yeah. right? So on page 51, um, Dr. T covers this topic. Maybe you can just, just briefly that there is an act uh, that governs that um, people can have, can decide, have the option, have the right to have abortions and um, in what circumstances can they have those abortions and in the timing um, of, of those abortions and leave out the, the, the guilt part. Because I think you, co you, co you cover it quite nicely in the book, mm -hmm. how the emotional aspects of it after somebody has gone through such an experience. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can just summarize it for us in terms of, you know, at what stages, what does the act say, the duties of the professional uh, healthcare providers and also um, just generally to people 
um, a, a listening out there about about when and how you can have the, the, the different stages of abortion. And I think it's very important to also recognize that this is the only act in South Africa that actually speaks specifically to a medical intervention. And so that tells us the fact that we have to have an act beyond the constitution that will then influence policy and how we then offer the service is very telling in terms of the magnitude and why it's important to protect these rights. It's about the right to autonomy, making decisions about your body. Yeah. Do I want to be pregnant or do I not want to be pregnant? Mm -hmm. And by the way, even with the best contraceptions out there, there are percentages of them that can fail, mm -hmm. right? So it's no use blaming or shaming people who want to end a pregnancy. Yeah. And in South Africa, the Choice on Termination of Pregnancy Act says up to 12 weeks, you can have an abortion upon request. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to sit and give a long threaded reason and story. And, and I help so many women. You know, they come prepared to tell me some long... I said, if you don't want to be pregnant anymore, that's enough. You don't need to validate it further for me. Yeah. That's enough. You have a right. Yeah. Mine is to say, these are the medical options, mm -hmm. and then you make a decision based on the information and, you know, assisting people. Yeah. Between 13 to 20 weeks, there are certain circumstances that are given. Yeah. For example, if the pregnancy is a result of incest or rape, if there's a risk of congenital abnormalities, if there's a risk of injury, either physical or mental, to the person who's pregnant, and if the pregnancy will significantly affect your social or economic status, which is very important. Yeah. And if you can read between the lines, you can see that it's giving people um, their rights throughout, right? If you say, look, I am pregnant, mm -hmm. but perhaps my social and economic status has changed. I'm now retrenched. I thought I could afford a child. Mm -hmm. I now can't. Mm -hmm. You have a right mm -hmm. to go to a healthcare provider and request the termination. Mm -hmm. And for 20 weeks and upwards, you, you can do an abortion if there would be severe congenital malformation mm -hmm. of the fetus, or if the pregnancy would endanger the life of the pregnant person, or if the pregnancy posed a risk of injury to the fetus itself. Um, and again, you know, there are, there's no right or wrong way to react. The fact that people need abortions in the first place mm -hmm. tells us that there's already something happening. So we can't then blame the abortion when people are going through whatever they are going through. Yeah. What we do do is give people counseling. We remain absolutely available to offer them support. Mm -hmm. And research has been done, and you say this, I was actually helping a producer of a TV show the other day uh, with the framing because I wanted to discuss abortion. Mm -hmm. And I sent them a lot of research, and some of it even from 2021, mm -hmm. talking about the overwhelming feeling that people have after an abortion, mm -hmm. which is relief. Yeah. That's the overwhelming feeling. Mm -hmm. Some people, you can imagine, if you've been wanting to get pregnant, mm -hmm. and your doctor actually says there's some major abnormalities here, mm -hmm. And in order to save your life, we have to do an abortion or terminate the pregnancy. Sometimes it's doctors, we are the ones who say to patients, this needs to happen. Yeah. So we can't shame people for having a medically necessary research procedure. It's one of the most simplest to do, one of the safest to do. Um, and it's about removing the shame um, that we impart on women. Many people have really severe and uncontrolled hypertension in pregnancy. Many people may have diabetes in pregnancy. Some people may be epileptic. Some people, you know, there are so many other medical reasons why for the person who's pregnant, mm. it's also important for them to have an abortion. So it's not that abortions are for young, loose girls. Many people, by the way, who have abortions are not young women. They are married couples. Also research-based, we know from research. So there's a lot that can happen. You have people spending a lot of money on, on, on intra, um, uh, in vitro fertilization, mm -hmm. you know, the specialized fertility treatment, yes. only to ask for an abortion once they are pregnant because the relationship has disintegrated and there is absolutely nothing left in the relationship mm -hmm. for whatever other reason yeah. that's got nothing to do with the pregnancy. Yeah. And they have a right to decide that. So there are so, so many different reasons. Women come and say, look, I was on an antibiotic. No one told me that if I'm on an antibiotic, the pill won't work, yeah. I must use a condom, yeah. and now I'm pregnant. Mm. We shame that person? No. You shouldn't. You shouldn't. There's, a, there's another point you, you raised there, um, 
being Disability Month, I think this month or the coming months. What we've, or oh, at least from the little research that I've done, you see that there's a lot of young women, especially from rural areas mostly, um, who are perhaps um, mentally um, challenged or they've got learning uh, uh, disabilities and they get to be victims of sexual violence. And in that case, they become pregnant. So in most cases, they don't even know the person who's, who's raped them. They can't really articulate what happened because of you know, the, 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 the difficulties that they have uh, cognitively. Um, at, at what point do we as a country make an intervention in such instances? Look, I think ultimately systems that are working together and interconnected, you know, we should have a health system, a healthcare system um, where social workers can say, we have identified in this particular village, in this particular home, that there is a challenge. Because remember, many of those children are actually just growing up with undiagnosed issues. Yes. We say it's cognitive, it's mental, but they've actually never had actual medical intervention and proper support and diagnosis um, and, and even therapy to try and improve, right, um, their cognitive level. So it speaks to failures on multiple levels. And I think ultimately for me it's because the systems are not talking to each other and not responding to what the other needs up until something criminal happens. And my argument all the time is that we don't only have to wait to intervene when a crime has been committed on, perp on people. People need to thrive anyway, whether or not a crime has been committed. Those young people who have disabilities of whatever kind, they need every single day outside of seeing them as victims or as people who have undergone a crime to be supported and, 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 and um, you know, living in communities that can provide them the social and, and, and emotional and psychological um, support. So a lot of the times, by the way, we have difficulty trying to get the police to give us and brick and come um, when we do the abortion. Because remember, the, the products of conception have DNA in them, mm. right? Mm. And they can use that in the DNA rape kit to try and connect the perpetrator, yeah. who may very well have already had some interaction with police, right? Mm. And it's, it's, it's hard to get them to come. And we're like, we need to perform this you know, uh, uh, um, intervention. Yeah. And there are products that you can use for a DNA um, kit f mm. for rape, and they just don't show up. And so how much do you delay doing the abortion in the hope that the police will then come to do, because the chain of evidence is important, right? The docket is important. And so it, it becomes really, really difficult um, to manage. It shouldn't. Yeah. But it is because this, the systems and the different people are not talking and not working um, together for the ultimate goal. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Titi. I'm going to go to the questions now before my colleagues kill me. Okay. Dr. T, how can we communi with, communicate with kids health-wise? I think Dr. T has covered this one. And why is it so difficult to talk about sex, especially to our daughters? We've covered that one. Is it normal for women to start menopause as early as 33 years of age, and why is that? It can happen. It is simply called early menopause or premature ovarian failure. Um, it can be primary or secondary. Secondary meaning there's a cause for it. Primary meaning there isn't an identifiable cause. I would say see your doctor or see a specialist as soon as you can because with menopause and the decrease in estrogen, we know that your bone mass can also decrease. You're at risk of having fractures. You may be just struggling also, right, from the decrease in estrogen with um, insomnia, mood changes, concentration, memory, hot flushes, all of those things you can also be assisted as you go through it. But you need to understand, I mean, for a lot of women at 33, um, I mean, I only had my first child around that age, you know, you are still thinking about starting a family and now you're dealing with um, early menopause. So how, you know, counselling and talking about your options as well, um, if you are someone who wants um, to have children literally birthing them, um, you, you will speak to your doctor about that. I'm a 40-year-old woman. Is it normal to have emotional moments like cry when you're sad, cry when you're happy? 
And right. I don't sound like there's a problem there. Cry, beloved. Cry. <laughs> you know, we shame, and, and, and I've said this before, I said to my friend, why can't we normalize crying? Even in public spaces, why I hike it la? <laughs> or you, I get a call from you, VUA, and I'm excited about something you told me. And it's, it's just tears of joy, right? But yes. I must, like, pretend like I have something in my... I am an... I don't lay man. As long as you don't feel completely helpless and out of control, because remember, a lot of... Not a lot, some mental health problems can, can come through with you not being able to contain your emotions, where your emotions become inappropriate for what's happening. Yeah. But honestly, if something is so incredibly fun and exciting that you just burst into tears out of excitement, do it. If you are so sad and so aware of your emotion and where you are and you need to cry it out, yeah. cry. It's a, it's a release. I can tell you that. And <laughs> secondly, I was at a friend's wedding. I mean, her dad was so, gave such a moving speech about loving and the epitome of marriage, mm. really. And I cried, you know? And everyone in the table was like, but anyway, <laughs> so and men must cry and boys must cry. We must stop saying boys mustn't cry. Absolutely. They must absolutely cry mm -hmm. so that we teach children how to process emotion. We validate that frustration that sometimes they have as children to not be able to articulate to us exactly everything they feel. Yeah. And by saying don't cry, you are also saying don't, you are invalidating what they are feeling, mm -hmm. right? And you are saying to them what you feel um, is less important than decorum and being looking like we're a perfect family. If, if Banaba Batla Hula, let them and cry. Not. We need to. Pray. No, no, we must cry in front of them. True. Mm. That's true. About sexual pleasure. Hello, Dr. T. What causes swelling usually triggered during sex next to the vaginal opening and it appears red and it's itchy? Is it treatable and how? So there's something that we all don't know. It's some. Um, and dermatology, right? It's the skin. The skin is your largest organ. So even around your vaginal opening, your labia, everything, it's all about skin. You can have skin-related, dermatology-related conditions that have got nothing to do with sex or STIs. And many people get treated over and over and over again for thrush and STI when they actually have a dermatological problem. Um, so things, you know, like lichen planus, for example, um, one of the most common ones that are usually missed. So I would say see a dermatologist who, who is keen and knows and interested in genital dermatology. There's a lot that can go, even eczema. People can have eczema around their labia as well. Um, it doesn't always mean an STI. And you, of course, you will probably see it around sex because I get this friction yeah. at the time. And so it aggravates the, the inflammation. And use lube, 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 lube. Use lubricants all the time. All the time. All right. Okay, on the lube issue, um, Dr. T, what causes vaginal dryness and, and what can be done to remedy that? So it depends. And what we think is dry may actually be normal. Um, depending on, firstly, your cycle, where you are. Yeah. So some people, just before they ovulate, just after they ovulate, just before a period, just after a period, they may experience dryness. Mm -hmm. That's already four weeks mm -hmm. of the month. Mm -hmm. So you need to know your cycle and see where in the cycle okay. are you experiencing this. Is it a new thing? Because depending on where you are in your reproductive cycle, mm -hmm. you may be starting to go into menopause, mm. and one of the first things is my vagina is dry, I'm always dry. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then we start doing the history and finding out that maybe there are other symptoms to suggest that. There may be other medications that a person is taking. Detoxing medication, flu medication, the same way it dries out your nose and you're like, I can breathe again. It's the same way it can dry out your vagina because it's the same mucous membranes. Yeah. And yeah, so it's medication, other, other medical conditions, okay. or just going through menopause, or depending on where you are in your cycle, it may very well be um, normal for you. Yeah. But lube, please. Lubricants are not for people who have problems. <laughs> Lubricants are literally uh, uh, to enhance pleasure for everybody. Okay. Um, I'm over 40 years. How do I get back my sexual drive? It's covered in the book. Mm -hmm. Especially for the over 40s because <laughs> no one talks about sexual pleasures for older women. And I made sure um, to include it in there because often when we are older, we've gone through life, right? Either we've been divorced um, or your partner has passed away. 
you are, and there's so many expectations about women who have lost partners, right? Mm -hmm. That we must maintain and love our partners eternally and to show that we loved them so much, we can never be with anyone else. And like, come on, right? <laughs> come on. So there's a lot about shame and the fact that there isn't enough that assists older women have good sex. And I do, I made it a point that I cover it. And the book is not about women only, by the way. There's no mention of women on the title. And yet people will be like, is it, is it for women? It's written by a woman. It doesn't mean it's only for women. So even for older men, we speak about the different ways in which their own pleasure can be impacted by the different medical issues, but also just age and what it looks like um, to have sex at, at yeah. that age. I'm going to refer you... Uh the person, person who asked this question, I'll refer you to the exact page. But um, more, this is quite important and something that I wanted to cover. Cancer. Mm. It being cancer month, um, this month. How, do, how to deal with breast cancer diagnosis and the removal of the breast thereof? What does the diagnosis mean to other women in the family? So I suppose if it's hereditary... Yeah. Look, the genetic one is important, and I think um, in South Africa we don't have many genetic counsellors, but there is something called genetic counselling where you can actually map out for your family tree what are the types of cancers. Some are hereditary, of course, like breast cancer, but there are other types of breast cancers that aren't. Um, and so you need to know, and there are tests that can be done to determine which one you have. And I think that's how you would then know how to have the conversation with the rest of your family. The diagnosis can be very shocking, depending on if you are someone who's used to doing their own self-breast exam every month. How did you find out about the lump in the first place, right? Often already sets the tone for um, um, breaking of the bad news. I think it's very hard for women who have their breasts removed because the same way that our vaginas, everyone is telling us what's wrong with them, mm. the same way we get judged for women and how we look, right? Yeah. And so being a woman with just one breast can affect your self-esteem, yeah. um, whether or not you have a partner, right? Yeah. Some of these things just affect you because they're happening to you. Yeah. What then tends to happen is that women who do have partners then become under incredible pressure. And a lot of them have delayed surgery because of this question. Will I be woman enough? Mm. Will my partner stay? Will I still, you know, and these are the kinds of things that as a doctor, you want to have conversations as a family, as a couple. Mm. But again, in terms of mental health support, very underfunded and under-resourced in this country. So how many family counselors do we have in those very villages you are speaking about who can have these conversations, you know? So it, it, it's, it's incredibly difficult. Uh, but once surgery has happened, the healing um, you know, d does set in. Those who can afford can have some reconstruction. Um, and usually the discussion about reconstruction happens before surgery. And depending on where the cancer is and how it's affecting your skin, for example, um, you may very well not be able to, 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 to do it. But sometimes um, it, it can be done, yeah. OK. Just to know that breast cancer can affect both men and women. Absolutely. It can, just, breast, it can, it can affect just... any breast tissue. And funny enough, in South Africa, a lot more men uh, are still getting breast cancer than before. Mm. And they, the diagnosis is happening late because of this idea that it's a woman-only problem. Yeah. Right? Remember the hormones and our bodies don't know women, men, whatever. They just know the body. This is the body we are in. So we have to ensure. And that's why life orientation, I keep going back there. Yeah. This is why both, all the children, all genders must be in that life orientation. Because not only do girls need to know about menstruation, mm -hmm. boys need to know about menstruation. Because some of the myths about menstruation, what happens to, to vaginas is perpetuated by men. So they need to know early on the right information so that no one is, you know, perpetuating myths um, based on, on, on no information. Towel gang. Anyway, <laughs> um, this question is covered in the very first two pages of the book. But anyway, when you lose your virginity, you are meant to bleed. What happens in the event that you don't bleed? Is it normal? So I know that you've got books for everyone. I know that as a fact. And I know that they will get to them, yeah. but virginity as a concept is something that personally I don't recognize. 
not personally, I don't recognize virginity as a concept. Mm -hmm. So the idea that you are even losing something by having sex is very foreign to me. Mm -hmm. I, I don't prescribe to that. Yeah. And thirdly, yes, there is a hymen, right, which is a very thin membrane, mm -hmm. and it looks very different for many people. Some people, for example, if you look at me and my face, it's not the same. My left face is not the same as my right side. There's asymmetry there. That's just how life is. So even with valvas, even with hymens, some people have them, some people don't. Mm -hmm. The idea of bleeding is so that men can prove that you remained pure for them. You saved yourself for them, <laughs> right? In some cultures, they even go to the extent of laying a white sheet and in the morning, the elders want to see what's on the sheet. I don't prescribe to that. It perpetuates very harmful stereotypes about women, about our genitals, about socially, how we are socialized and how we engage with each other. And if boys and men, it's so normalized for them to be macho and to have as much sex as they're having, who are they having it with if women are all preserving themselves for the white sheet and for the bleeding hymen? Who are men having sex with? Then someone must tell us the truth, sure. right? They can't be bragging about how much sex they are having. And at the same time, having these expectations of purity. A, a virgin. For a virgin. So who are they having sex with? They must tell us. So that's why I don't prescribe to virginity. Yeah. And I don't prescribe to this idea that women lose something or give up something. Sex should be consensual, it should be an enthusiastic process, and people involved in it must be deriving pleasure that they have defined for themselves. Um, if you are losing something, if you feel that you need to prove things about you having sex, there's problems there in how sex is defined, and unfortunately, the expectations that have been imposed on you as a person, and for many people, they don't know the alternative. True. Also, uh, in the book, it is covered that you you can lose your hymen just by riding your bicycle or your, a horse. Yeah. Uh, um, we are more than our hymens, our womanhood. You know, and this is what the, dehumanizes the, us. The, People yeah. stop seeing us as humans. We are just things, right? And we are just tools for them, yeah. for them to have pleasure with. But we are not humans. And, the, and then when you talk about the levels of violence in this country, it needs us to see the humanity in all of us. Yeah. All of us, whether it's racial, whether it's gendered, mm. whether you're talking about people with disabilities, it's, the, it's the ultimately the lack of respect and the lack of seeing the human in the other person. And that's why you see the levels of, I mean, you can talk about Brazil, Latin America, Europe, anywhere. Some countries are dealing with rape mm. and the problems that we are dealing with, mm. but not at the type of violence that we are. There is something to be said about continuing these things and passing them on mm -hmm. as if it's okay to see us as women with vaginas as just these things um, that are supposed to just mature and be big enough yeah. so that men can do with them what they want. Yeah. And if we say no, suddenly we are the problem because, excuse me, you, you think you know too much. Uh, and, and, and Dr. Chia, I think you covered this quite well in the book. That's why I, I spoke earlier about body positivity, that women need to own their bodies secondly, also own their sexual pleasure. It is not for the other person, right? This person is asking uh, when and what to discuss with her in early teens. You've, I think you've covered this. The earlier, the, the, the better in building the relationship with the children. And sometimes and it's about trust. ending the stigmas and the, and the myths, yeah. right? Maybe you're not saying much, but at least you are not perpetuating wrong yeah. things. Yeah, right. And rather get a book, get a resource, get something trusted where yeah. you can get the information first for you, then you'll be able to give the information to younger ones. Okay. Your choices as a patient when it comes to C-section, we've covered this in, in quite detail. I'm using YEZ contraceptives, so after every 16th day I bleed, and, f and then four days is my normal cycle. Is this normal? What do you think? This one needs to see that doctor, because now it's medical advice. Yeah, yeah. It's no longer information. No, and, yeah, and we, yeah. yeah, but no. it's important. Remember, when you're on a contraceptive, mm -hmm. when you have those pills at the end of the packet, yes. 
the blood you see is not a period. It's just a breakthrough bleed. It's called breakthrough bleed. Mm -hmm. And I tease my patients and I say, if you are Dr. T's patient and you're on a contraceptive and you say you are on your period, it means I'm doing something wrong. That's how I know <laughs> that we are spending enough time talking about what happens. Yeah. It's a breakthrough bleed, and it happens because the hormones have gone down in the blood system to trigger a endometrial lining yeah. for it to shade a little bit. And there's this misconception that women wanted to see a period every month, mm -hmm. so there had to be these few pills so that we feel like normal, oh. but really and truly, there is, the blood is not going anywhere. How pills work, and the particular oral contraception, is that they stop ovulation. If you are not ovulating, you will not go into an endometrial lining shed in a whole period yeah. because there's no ovulation. But because they've taken the pill dose low and low and low just in that last few days, it's just enough to trigger the bleeding, but you are still not ovulating. But if you stop too long, the pill in the blood will go down so much that the ovulation will actually then start. Okay. So we need to just be careful about um, the pill when you stop. If you miss a pill, what do you do? But have that conversation um, with your doctor. Maybe that, that the dose is too low for them because also with weight, right? If you are more than 85 kgs, you can't use a patch, for example because it, it, the, the dose then doesn't do what it needs to do. Yeah. Depending on the person, there may be a need to change. Right. Um, I've heard a lot of scary stories about giving birth. Does your vagina go back to normal or just something they say to make you feel better? Try it out. Yeah, no, it's, it's not something <laughs> they say to make you feel better, but the problem is the impatience, right? Yeah. People think you, you literally give birth through the vagina to an entire human, an entire fetus. And now tomorrow you must be able to be snapped back and, and no, it takes time. Yeah. Emotionally, it takes time. Physically, it takes time. And we know the postpartum period, and many of us on the international space talking about human rights, mm -hmm. are actually advocating that the postpartum period must be officially recognized those three months after giving birth. Because remember, we have the first and second and third trimester. We're actually now wanting a fourth trimester where companies and people will actually, by law, be forced to give people that full trimester off, mm. right? As opposed to rushing us back to work two weeks, three weeks after you've given birth because now your job is at risk, right? There's something to be said about labor practices, but what's important is that to recognize it takes time. It can take up to two years mm. for people to actually feel like themselves again. Mm. Throw in their breastfeeding, mm. throw in their sleepless nights, relationship issues, who knows? Yeah. Financial, socioeconomic issues, there's a lot. So the idea that sex isn't good after giving birth, it's because your vagina is loose, is completely wrong. Mm. And again, mm. it plays into that mindset mm. that Runa, our jobs, is to have these perfect vaginas that other people do things to them. What are, what, is, what are they doing? When you are busy breastfeeding and raising a child after giving birth, <laughs> that they are so concerned about sex. You see, they must be busy raising kids too. As well. Then we'll be in sync because now you realize how hard it is. Then you'll actually be more compassionate. Yeah. You are actually understanding as opposed to just rushing into, women yeah. to get back into shape, snap it back. Our bodies will, are not designed to snap back into anything. That's why the aging process is the way it is. You can't reverse it. Um, and so... At some other point, we should have a discussion. There's something that I, I, I got a glimpse of from my grandmother who was a midwife, traditional midwife, and a stories from my mother is that she, those generations of people always thought that after giving birth, the person who's given birth must be looked after. You know, uh, so, that, so, one, so, that so, church so, I can go to. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> we, we'll talk about that some other time. Let's 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 um, serve the colleagues so that yeah they are happy with Dr. T. Right? Um, is there anything I can do about PMS? It's really bad. I become really frustrated and moody. Yes, there are things you can do. Yeah. The main thing I would say is start tracking your period, which I think they are doing because they know it's PMS. Yes. So it means there's a cyclical predictable pattern. Um, and depending on how bad it is, right, if it's impacting your quality of life, your work output, your productivity, whatever it is, tell your doctor. 
and there are ways in which they can help you improve whatever the impact is. Some people who unfortunately end up on antidepressants and you know how there's stigma, right? That's why I say unfortunately because there's always stigma around that. Yeah. But we need to remove that and see it as part of, for me to function and for me to feel well and to be healthy, this is what I need to take. People who are diabetic and hypertensive, they don't get shamed for taking medication they need to control their hypertension and diabetes. So yeah. people who need antidepressants should also not be shamed. And if it's impacting you that much, I would definitely say, have a discussion about your doctor, uh, to, to your doctor. And some people, of course, then um, experience the same emotional stuff on certain contraceptives. Have a discussion with your doctor and change. There are so many other modern options um, of contraceptives that, um, you know, uh, work well and they actually can alleviate some of those problems. So have a talk with your doctor. It's, it's absolutely common. And for some people, it goes into a full-on mood disorder and depression and depending on what the, the other associated stuff is. So don't take it lightly. I mean, the fact that you've identified um, and, and it's that much, I think it's enough for you to seek help. Yeah. All right. Does birth control contraceptives affect sexual pleasure? And secondly, is there a long-term side effect of epidural? So with the epidural, some people say they have headaches, uh, but they gradually go away. With some people, when they have headaches, the treatment is having an epidural. So, <laughs> you know, yeah. it just depends on who you are. Um, but uh, lower back pain for a few months can happen. Again, if you are making these decisions, you need to be asking them, of the doctor who's going to take the consent from you to do the procedure. But I'm just giving you briefly some of the, um, the sure. things. Um, the first question was about the epidural. It, the, the birth control, oh, does if, it if they affect uh, uh, a sexual pleasure. Sexual pleasure. So some can, yes. Okay. Um, where some people experience um, a little bit of a decrease in, in libido than they are used to. Okay. Sometimes um, a, a little bit of dryness than they are used to. But often, it's not that drastic of a change that people stop the contraceptive. It's just saying, yes, it can happen. And actually, not getting pregnant is more important to them than the fact that they are now having sex three times a week and not four times a week. And sometimes, you know, you, it's something manageable. Mm -hmm. Like I said, a lubricant should be used by everybody. Um, especially if you're using condoms, you should be using lubricants because the latex in condoms is actually very drying itself. And then the, oh. the oil on the condom is not for a lubrication. It's just there to make sure the condom doesn't lose its integrity from the manufacturer to the oh. packaging to the transportation and the storage. Okay. So you need to be using a lubricant. Okay. If you don't use condoms, you need to use a lubricant because also the lips and the valva also have that friction and they too need to be looked after, you know, yeah. yeah. Right, I hope the colleagues are happy there, right. Um, are sexual tours alien to Africans and the oh. church? <laughs> well, I, I've seen, um, I'll let Dr. T answer, I've seen something in Egypt, but yeah. Yeah, no, 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 oh, exactly. The history of sex, no, 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 no. Sex tours are amazing because they offer you uh, something different, something fun, um, something to enhance, some kink in your relationship. Um, some people never use them, but they have no feelings about them. Some people have never thought about them until their partner says, hey, have you seen this? Do you want to try that? And they absolutely love it, right? Mm, the thing about sex toys is that you need to remember, for example, if it has batteries, it can't go in in the vagina. Sometimes there's different um, manufacturers that you can't put it in the bath. It's not waterproof. Some are waterproof. If it has a cord, for example, and it connects to a power source, definitely not to be inserted anyway. Don't use near water, right? Yeah. A lot of them, for example, to know if they're made of silicone to use a water-based lubricant because a silicone lubricant can sometimes affect the integrity of the toy over time. Um, still use a condom when you are using toys, another important one. If you are a woman, for example, using a toy on another woman, um, it's very easy to think that there's no STI issue. Mm -hmm. There is. Mm -hmm. So remember how to use safer sex tools like condoms, like dental dams, which is the square latex, yes. um, also when you are incorporating um, sex toys. Again, unfortunately, I did a book... <laughs> in Botswana and they were like, don't bring those, you will end up in jail. I didn't know that sex toys are illegal in Botswana. So know about where you're going. If you're doing a staycation or a vacation wherever in another country, yeah. before you pack them, find out because unlike me, 
uh, you might end up with problems. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, there's a question um, on hormonal replacement therapy, whether it causes cancer or not. So you need to know your own genetics and what your own risks are for cancer. Mm -hmm. Because remember the whole the question earlier on about um, if the diagnosis has implications for other women in the family. Yeah. This is why you need to know. Because some cancers grow because of the estrogen. So if we are giving you estrogen to treat the menopausal symptoms, we need to know before that, that you know, you're genetically, so that's why you can't just go over the counter and just do some of this. You know, some women are like, you need to consult, I can't just give you the information on Twitter or whatever, and they get so like upset, like just tell me, this is why, right? You need a whole consultation because a person's personal and medical history is very important in terms of ultimately what decisions we are making. Yeah. There are non-hormonal support, okay. and there are still coming tablet forms which can still help those um, who are experiencing symptoms and who may need some form of support. So it doesn't mean because you can't take an estrogen mm. that you, there's nothing at all. There are um, alternatives. For example, there may be those who can't take estrogen are experiencing vaginal dryness from radiation or from whatever. There are still creams and things that we can use that don't have estrogen, um, you know, to, to improve, um, yeah, comfort. Okay. Um, and then there was a question about, is it normal for a 43-year-old to be still experiencing severe period pains? Yeah, I assume it is. I guess. I and speak to your doctor about pain management. I think this is something I can say without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah. Many of us are not managed well for our menstrual, gynecological pains. Yeah. So have a discussion about your doctor. There are definite medications out there that work really well for period pains. You know, okay. and this is something that I always say. If you are a patient of Dr. T, that's another thing I judge myself on. My patients cannot walk around in pain because of menstruation every month. Mm. That's one of the things that I judge myself on. Okay. It's the ability to which we are able to manage pain. Mm. And there are different methods available out there. Suppositories you can use in the bum okay. during that time. There's oral medications you can use. There's patches you can use. You can try different combinations. I mean, you may have other medicines you are taking, right? And perhaps mm. this particular pain medication may not work well or maybe it interacts with others. I mean, there's a whole plan that can be made. And I think it's important um, that people, you know, see their doctors. Remember, there are other gynecological reasons like endometriosis, hmm. fibroids, that can make you have really, really painful periods. Yeah. And so if we are just only concerned about period pain and not what could be the underlying cause, we are also not going to assist you well. So you need to have absolutely those annual medical examinations. Very important for this reason. Yeah. We need to start to see what your body does naturally on its own so that when things start to happen, we actually know what your baseline is. Okay. Colleagues, we are three minutes a little bit over the time we scheduled with Dr. T. Um, I have gone through all of the questions. I am asking that you please do fill in the survey form with your comments and maybe more questions if you still have. The advice I can give you, though, is that please go through the book read the book, um, it's really very um, educational. I don't know, Dr. T, other thing I wanted to ask you, would you like to do a children's version of this book? You put me on the spot. <laughs> so, so I was supposed to send my manuscript to my publisher, oh. who I hope is not watching, a match already. So I don't know how many months I'm late, but yes, there is a... <laughs> Okay. There okay. is a young reader's um, book that's okay. in the works. And okay. I mean, life happened, COVID happened, guys. I was a bit late. Uh, but yes, it's definitely in the works. All right. Yeah. All right. Um, sexual drive. There, 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 there were colleagues who were asking whether the male colleagues have joined. Yes, the invitation has, it was sent to all stuff. Um, so the male colleagues actually hounded me last night and said, where's the invitation? It was sent. I do hope that they were able to join and uh, benefit um, from this conversation. I know that we didn't touch more on the, the issues around erectile dysfunction, 
and sexual pleasure. My last question is on our, again, equipment or ability as a country to deal with the, the, the needs for transgender mm. a, 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 a people and, 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 and the community at large. Yeah, that's important because many a times um, because, again, even the schooling system, you know, a girl or a boy, we don't get much space to identify as anything else. So by the time people can truly be who they are and identify themselves um, either transgender or non-binary is when they are adults. Mm. If you are lucky, you live in a household that's affirming, that is that safer space, perhaps as a teenager, you are able to be comfortable enough to say, actually, this is not who I am and this is who I am and define that for yourself. I think what we need more and more is um, a society, a country that allows self-determination. Mm -hmm. And I think we take that for granted. But self-determination is one of the most basic, basic needs of, of humans. Yeah. Um, and that's why there's so much control about what we can determine for ourselves. And that's why there's us who are fighting back to say, no, we, we want to be able to determine and have autonomy. And I think when it comes to gender um, identity and expression as well, it's very, very important. And gender identity and gender expression has got nothing to do with who you are having sex with, by the way. Mm. And this is another myth, misconception and, 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 and the difficulties that people have. But it does take, unfortunately, because of the delays in the public health system, there are only two centers in South Africa that can offer trans-affirming health care, okay. Cape Town and Pretoria. Okay. So if you are in Kwakwa in any of those villages, when are you going to get to Pretoria or to Cape Town? Mm -hmm. Probably never. So we have a huge chunk of our community and population and fellow South Africans who cannot assess the hormones or the surgical interventions mm -hmm. that they require for them to feel and look like who they want to. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem, is that, and, and then because they, they, they can only really come out and, and, and demand these as adults, because as a child, which system, which health system and which doctor will you be fighting for these rights? It's mm -hmm. only when you are older. Yeah. It's already, they're in their 30s, 40s, some of them. Mm -hmm. So there's a bit of injustice that we have a whole community in the country that we don't recognize fully and support them fully to be who they are. And I think our constitution is great, but we still need these rights to come alive and to be tangible. And that's for me, as a country, as a medical system in South Africa, I think is our litmus test. People can't wait 20 years for surgical interventions to be who they truly are. And that's the average, and that's been done um, you know, over the years in terms of the average waiting time. And that's in the public sector. In the private, it's slightly different, but it's also very expensive. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, and we know how we treat people. Mm. We know how we treat people and the names we call people, yes. right, in the yes. communities. So by the time they are adults, they've already had to deal with verbal abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, um, and, and some instability in terms of their families. And, and so we need to look at it broadly as a society to say, what kind of society do we want to be where anyone, anywhere mm. can self-identify and be autonomous? Yeah. And how do we then create services to make sure that that happens? Yeah. The last question, or maybe a comment. They're very naughty there. Um, is Dr. T needs to guide us in whether we are doing things right in the bedroom, <laughs> show us and tell us more about sexual pleasure. I don't know, colleagues, if we have time for that. Um, but I wrote about it. Uh, uh, There's a label I talk about. <laughs> I was about to say that. Yeah, um, and, I, and yeah. I was very naughty because I tell you the whole story about how um, they had their orgasm on radio. And I was describing what I thought was very boring details, you know, about the vulva. Yeah. And, you know, Lebu had never looked down there, so she had no idea what to look. Uh, and I've also had this experience with um, a newlywed couple. Yes. Who said they were Christian and they had saved themselves for marriage. And now they are together and no one knows what's happening. <laughs> and also with them, I assisted them in terms of this is where you find the clitoris. This is where you look for this. And I did put them in here um, just for for all of you, because I knew what 
<laughs> you won't believe me, Jane. Eh? If I just say, oh, sexual pleasure is a thing. <laughs> but a proof. And the proof is definitely there. I'm in section two of the book. It's dedicated to pleasure. Only yeah. pleasure. <laughs> and 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 do read the the, the 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 portion both male and 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 female colleagues uh, uh, all colleagues read the, the section about the clitoris if you are you know a woman and heterosexual yeah. and, and the big oh, o oh, not. and yes right. it's it's all the there <laughs> it's all there unfortunately we have uh, run out of time um, Dr. T, I think there is a lot to talk about in terms of sexual health. We didn't even touch on the medical conditions, except a little bit um, about about cancer, um, on sexual pleasure. Obviously, we didn't, um, uh, to the satisfaction of the colleagues listening out there, touch on that. Sexual rights, consent, um, and there was a report that I saw recently about the fact that due to the COVID pandemic and that people are at home more, there's been more rapes, there's been more uh, 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 teenage pregnancies that have come as a result of that. Uh, skyrocketing figures, if I recall. Um, those are some of the things that perhaps when we have a second uh, discussion or a bite on this, we can delve much more into. And your, your activism work. So your last uh, parting shots from you before we, we go home. Yes, um, and just briefly on those statistics, right? I think they were wrongfully framed, and I saw the media headline, Teenage Pregnancy on the Rise. It's not teenage pregnancy. Children who are 10, 11, 12, 13, and they are not teenagers. So the question is, who's raping children, right? And it feeds into the other conversation we had about how men are given the rights, right, to be macho and ex express, but who are they having sex with if adult women their age must preserve for themselves for marriage? Very, very important discussions we need to be having. Um, but I think, yes, there's a lot to talk about. Without consent, there can never be pleasure. Sexual pleasure depends on ongoing enthusiastic consent. And consent involves more than just, yes, let's have sex, or no, not today. It's about how are we going to have sex? Whose positions are we going to have? Who's bringing the lubricant? Who's in charge of contraception in this relationship? Because contraception is not just a woman-only issue. So we need to be having those discussions. And it builds on communication techniques within the relationship more broadly. Yeah. Because you may have your own love language. I may have my own little things that I like. And if we are not talking, if we are not consenting to sex, if we are not giving each other the details, how will we know those details? Because love is in the detail. That's what I always say. Yeah. Love is in the detail. Yes. And so to have consensual, affirming, and pleasurable experiences, um, we have to talk to one another. We have to talk to one another. There's nothing boring about talking to one another. Mm -hmm. We have to talk. If we are not talking, someone is not having a good time in that relationship. And let's make sure that we are where we are wanted mm -hmm. and the sexual acts and activities we engage with are both fulfilling for everyone who's part of that. Yeah. Dr. T, thank you very much. What I take away from today's discussion is that one, careers for some people are not just careers, they are callings. And to make a difference in the country, we ought to be looking at our careers as callings. What is it that I am called to do? Because there are many doctors but very few um, that view the profession the way you've articulated it today in saying, yes, it's medicine, but it's about human rights. It's about dignity. It's about fighting for those who are not able to fight for themselves. And your stars, ancestors, God aligned, whichever your belief system is, to ensure that your voice is heard you know, at the highest, or at least one of the highest bodies in the world, that is the UN, to, to pass that message on. I do hope that with this flame that you've lit, um, that it can light our other little flames as well, that wherever we are and whatever we do, I, I used to have a, 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 a boss manager, a, a Dr. Reverend Finger, who used to say, if you are a sweeper, you must be, be the, the best. best sweeper there is, you know, because you don't know what that does to the next person.
person. And, and, and for me, that's what I take away from today's conversation, that we have to be intentional about the work we mm. do um, because it has a greater impact and meaning to those that we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. We are very grateful for you to coming to the e-lounge, gracing us with your presence. Just off a flight, we owe you a debt of gratitude for that. This was amazing, and thank you for the invitation. I wouldn't have had it any other way, so thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. T. Thank you to the publishers, uh, uh, Penn Macmillan. Uh, you've been great partners. I know that Veronica and Aileen and the other partners are watching. Thank you to the viewers. Um, my colleagues, male friends, are saying they're watching on YouTube. <laughs> I knew you'd do that. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who's joined in and asked the questions and contributed to the conversation. It is an ongoing conversation because these platforms are for sharing knowledge and to ensure that you are coming out of here after these two hours empowered and enriched. So thank you very much. And the people behind the scenes are always, always very grateful to the technical teams behind the, scene, behind the scenes who make these things um, happen. Thank you so much. Uh, we will see you next week. We have another session um, in uh, commemoration of um, the Archbishop's birthday. So please stay tuned for that and join us next week. Thank you, Dr. T. Thank you, Viva. That was amazing. Thank okay. you. Thank you.